was 1935, and she was on her way to the New York Public Library. She was not going to look at legal texts, although she was going to become one of the great legal scholars of the 20th century. She was not going to look for theological texts, even though she was going to be the first woman ordained in the Episcopal Church. She was going to do research about her gender and sexuality. Pauline Murray was trying to understand herself. And as a budding scholar, she decided the library was the place to go. Her sexual orientation was toward other women. And her gender identity, as far as she could tell, was male. At that point, there was not a lot of time to or find a community of conversation for others who were experiencing these same things. Holly Murray did not write about this in her memoir. She gives one paragraph to her love life and her uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Again, she wouldn't have even had those categories. We're not discussed at all. But in her letters and journals that have now come down for biography, about and discuss and make sense of, we read a lot about her struggles. In her journal, she describes herself as a boy girl, which is what her Aunt Pauline called her, and which she just took up at her own description. She describes herself as in between male and female. And then, trying to find the right language, she says, maybe she has a male head and brain, question mark, femaleish body, mixed emotional characteristics, borderline marginal type. She describes one of nature's experiences, a girl who should have been a boy. Using some of the scientific language of her day, she says, uh, perhaps she is a pseudo-hermaphrodite with secretive male genitals. She went in for, uh, to have her appendix removed, and when she did so, she took the opportunity to ask the doctor while we were in there, See if there are male genitals inside me. She described her experience of this as producing inner conflicts and terror. When she was 15 years old, she uh, decided no longer to use the name she was given, Anna, and decided to try on some different names. Um, first she thought Paul, and then perhaps Peter, and then Duke. <laughs> uh, she ended up with Paul, and that was the name she went by for the rest of her life. She tried to get hormones to, uh, to uh, sort of bring out the masculinity that she felt within herself, but at that time that was not possible for her. So today we would describe this level of gender incongruity as transgender, not language that would have been uh, opened her at the time, so it's a bit anachronistic to try to go back and apply today's terms. Uh, but her description sounds a lot like what we would refer to with that term. And her description of inner conflicts and terror sounds a lot like what we would call gender dysphoria. Today, we are more likely to see Caitlyn Jenner or Lorraine Cox gender identity. But it's important and helpful to remember that there are others and that Pauline Murray can be for us also a face of gender uh, incongruity or transgender identity. We rightly celebrate Pauline Murray's work on behalf of civil rights, on behalf of women's rights. She was a trailblazing priest. But we can also celebrate the fact that she did these things even as she was trying to find comfort in her own skin. At three years old, her mother died. Her father didn't feel like he could take care of her, so she went to live with her aunt Pauline in Durham, North Carolina, and began to attend St. Titus Episcopal Church. Her father uh, was beaten to death in a racial incident when she was 12. 
And she and her aunt Pauline then uh, made a family. And she was a great student. She set her eyes on Columbia University, only to find that Columbia University did not accept women. And Barnard, the partner institution, was too expensive. She struggled again and again to find a place that were, would accept her. She, uh, at one point, applied to Harvard and found out Harvard also did not accept women. She applied to UNC Chapel Hill and found out that UNC does not accept African Americans. One door after another, after another was closed to her. She finally uh, went to Howard University for her law degree, a place where her race was not an issue, but her was. And she was excluded and discriminated against as a woman uh, among a student body in the law school that was entirely male and a faculty that was entirely male. She referred to this experience as an experience of Jane Crow. She did finally earn her law degree and she became the first doctor of jurisprudence, uh, the first African American doctor of jurisprudence at Yale University. She had uh, friendships and people she impacted profoundly. Uh, she was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt called her a firebrand. Her legal work impacted um, Thurgood Marshall, as well as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Finally, she made her way through a profound law career to a place as a tenured professor at Brandeis University only to discover at age 63 that she had a calling to the ministry. <laughs> and true to Pauline Murray's style, uh, she was not going to be held back by the fact that her own Episcopal Church did not ordain women. And so before the church ever ordained women, she took off and began seminary at uh, General in New York. She did her studies without any uh, sense of whether she would be able to be ordained. She completed her studies in 1976 at 66 years old. And on January 1st, 1977, the Episcopal Church ordained, uh, the Episcopal Church for the first time uh, made ordination of women a possibility. On January 8th, 8th of 1977, Mary <coughs> was ordained as the first African American woman in the Episcopal Church. Holly Murray was in some ways the poster child of Galatians 3.28. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, Galatians 3.28 has to be understood in light of Galatians 3.27. This is a baptismal claim that Paul is making, right? In 3.27, he says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Right? So the breaking down of these distinctions, the overthrowing of the principalities and powers of division and oppression were a result of being baptized into Christ and clothing oneself in Christ. This was made real, was made true by God's grace. Right? These distinctions are overthrown to Gentile, uh, slave-free, male-female. To the extent that these distinctions produce hierarchies and oppressions, these have been overthrown in Christ. That's true, and that's the work of God's grace. And for these things to become real on the ground involves our cooperating with God makes it true, we cooperate to help make it real. And that's what Pauline Murray's work was, to make real this reality that she knew to be true in her own baptismal life, that she knew to be true of the God who made her and came to be among us as Jesus. But there's that particular phrase, no longer male and female. Now in one sense, this corresponded precisely to so much of the work that Holly Murray did, um, working for the equality of the sexes, and this is where she worked closely with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This was crucial work. And no longer male and female meant that men and women were going to be equal before the law, that there would be no discrimination on the basis of sex. 
her own private life and her own experience of herself, there is no longer male and female may well have meant something else. Or at least for those of us who read this now in light of what we've come to know about her through her journals and letters. What would that have meant there is no longer male and female? Gregory of Nyssa reads this passage as a way of saying, um, in the eschaton there will be no gender. In heaven, gender will be gone, no longer male and female. We are all moving toward a gender. Now, Gregory's a minority voice on this, right? But, but this is his way of trying to make sense of, what, what does that mean? No longer male and female, this must be some sort of eschatological transformation that's going to happen. But there are other ways of thinking of this short of an entirely agendered or non-gendered experience of the eschaton. In some way, no longer male and female does suggest that something of that division, something of that distinction, the same way that Jew and Gentile as a distinction was being broken down, the dividing wall of hostility was being broken down, somehow male and female, something about that division was being broken down. And maybe it was fundamentally the hierarchy and power that was being broken but maybe it also had something to do with the many ways that we distinguish male and female in terms of what we can and can't do, in terms of how we can and cannot dress or present ourselves. Maybe something of that was also being broken down in Christ's work. And maybe in that way, Paul and Rory some therapy or something that could help her express the maleness that she actually experienced internally, maybe that was something like embracing the reality that in Christ there is no male and female. Maybe some sense of fluidity emerges there where we thought there were clear binary categories. Holly Murray's public achievements are celebrated rightly. But her struggle with her gender identity and her sexual orientation are also part of her witness. On November 23rd, 2019, Dion Johnson became the first openly gay black man to be elected Bishop of the Episcopal Church. And in an interview, he said, it was Pauli Murray who taught him, quote, to be who I am. We give thanks today for the life and witness of Pauli Murray. His accomplishments as well as her struggles show courage and perseverance and strength to stand with those who are left outside or left behind or left alone.